the last lecture, uh, I did follow. We had a d dimensional space time and called M. And I defined the space which I think I, I forget what, how I arranged a letter, something like that, which is a space of complex metrics on this. So this is an open subset in the, if you take an ordinary metric would be the section of the symmetric square of the curtain tangent bundle. And we pencil that with the complex numbers. So this the section of this would just be hexified metric, and we picked out an open subset of that. And the general Romanian metrics, ordinary Romanian metrics, are the real slice. And the redemption <coughs> metrics <coughs> so that of course again is real of course. <coughs> they sit on the boundary. <coughs> so um, so we now uh, just in order to so one of these things I shall refer to uh, that's the brevity as a width metric, just because I want to have some short way of referring to it. And I now want to modify slightly the definition of uh, the theory that I gave earlier. Remember, we consider d minus one dimensional manifolds and cobordisms m is dimension d from one to another. <coughs> And I said we associate the topological vector space with these. And to this we associate a trace class operator. Linear operator. Now this of course was meant to be a Romanian metric. But I now want to say I want this to be defined for every one of the width metrics. <coughs> the condition will be just the same, except that this was meant to defend, depend smoothly on the metric before, and now we'll say that we want it to depend homomorphically. <laughs> so as G moves around in that domain, uh, the thing is a homomorphism uh, <coughs> G. So we'll come back uh, in a moment to how we get to uh, the boundary and what happens there. Let me put in, remember in the last lecture I said there were a couple of things I was going to come back to, and this seems as good a moment as any to come back to them and make a couple of technical remarks. I'm afraid this is going to be a somewhat technical lecture altogether. Uh, <clears throat> so the first thing I promised to say something about is the kind of topological vector spaces I was discussing. <coughs> so let's first of all forget about the common it doesn't matter too much whether we think of complex metrics or not, what I'm going to say now. Remember that the space HN was associated uh, not to N but to the German. Because the picture like this of a D-dimensional manifold. Well, n is a d minus one dimensional manifold, so it's thickened up. Uh, well, now that means, you see, that together with m, we have lots of things which are, so to speak, if we think of this as going that way, we have lots of surfaces just a little bit to the downstream of it, and more surfaces upstream of it. So what we automatically have is a whole family of vectors. If we have anything of the kind I'm talking about, we automatically have a whole family of these things indexed by these 
various slices. And they're an ordered set uh, by one being to the left of the other in the obvious sense. So, you see, what we actually have automatically is some kind of, it's like a combination of a pro-object and an in-object. If we look downstream, we have a, a projective system. If we look upstream from where we start, we have an inductive system. Well, it, it would actually be quite, if we want it to be really fancy, we would work with these systems, because they're a good concept. But um, the simplest thing is to say that what we automatically have is the direct limit of the space is coming from this side, and the inverse limit of the space is coming from this side. So we'll write this as Hn like that, and the one on the other side is Hn with that kind of time. So we automatically have two topological vector spaces like that. And they fit into this family of trace class maps. So they're automatically nuclear spaces. Sorry? So, H2. Yeah. Where is H2? 
So, um, anyway, I recommend that category to you in either of the two versions. Of course, it depends on how it has a, it's a monoidal category, it has this nice fancy product, but uh, you mustn't think it's, a, it's not too perfect. I mean, we haven't made spaces of functions have finite, dis finite dimensions and so on by the argument that you have a rigid tensor category. What tensor product do you use? Sorry? What tensor product? Well, I defined it here. That's just Okay, this is a pi. Pi tensor product. Well, I sort of bypassed that way of saying it. It would be, uh, I dare say this would be the pi tensor product, I guess, if we did it on the, for the C infinity function. So. Um, so, uh, I think that's what I want to say. Uh, oh, 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 yes, just one small <coughs> uh, So, HN depends on this germ. Like now, in practice, it will not depend on the whole germ. It will depend on the Riemannian metric, F, the Riemannian manifold M, and a certain number of normal derivatives, like the, the first normal derivative of the metric is the second fundamental form that may depend on higher forms. Well, in the, the case of at least free field theories, in all the cases where I can discuss uh, and work it out in detail, this depends on, uh, so, so remember this is d minus 1, this depends on the integral part of d minus 1 over 2 normal derivatives of the metric. <coughs> so that means, you see, that if we're talking about two-dimensional theories, uh, this number is just zero, so you shouldn't need any normal derivatives at all. Uh, on the other hand, if we're talking about a four-dimensional theory, four-dimensional, so it's kind of the usual case, then this number is one, and so that means you expect to need to know the metric and the rate of change in the metric, the second fundamental form. That's the normal uh, Cauchy data you'd expect to have for a manual metric in physics. On the other hand, if you're trying to go above dimension four, then of course it's very dubious whether any genuine uh, <coughs> quantum field theories exist above dimension four, then you would need more data. So you'd need to know some rather unphysical information about how the metric was changing. And that may well have something to do with why it's difficult to construct theories above dimension four. People usually jump up at that moment and say, well, of course, there's this famous theory nowadays in dimension six, but it's a very supersymmetric theory and it's very special and its existence may somehow bypass this theory here that I'm talking about. Uh, well, the next technical thing I wanted to talk about, uh, oh, yes, sorry, but just one more thing. Uh, this definitely is the, for, for when n is smooth. One of the things I'm going to come to in, uh, in my lecture on Wednesday is that um, sometimes it's convenient not to have n smooth. In fact, if you think about it, the way that I'm doing it, supposing we were in, this was dimension one, Supposing we had something which had an angle, a corner, like that, with some angle. Then you see, we can think of that very well in this category, because you can think of this as a germ where all the downstream and all the upstream manifolds are smooth, and we just have one that has a corner in it, just one kink. Now I'm going to, on, in Wednesday's lecture, talk about that situation in a bit more detail, and uh, you'll see that while in two-dimensional theories, usually you don't need any normal structure, the space does actually remember the angle. So uh, that, that, that seems to be one of the interesting things about two-dimensional conformal field theory. Well, the next technical thing, is the last really tedious thing, I think, is unitarity. Uh, so we want to discuss whether things are Hilbert spaces, whether operators are unitary and so on from time to time. So we also want to be able to consider 
theories without that assumption. Well, in order, so we have to be rather careful of what we expect to happen. So let's think of n as being rather curved like this. So n is going to be going that way. Now, n is itself meant to be oriented, and it's meant to sit. So that arrow is meant to tell you an orientation or n. And it's meant to sit inside an oriented germ. And this thing, which tells you the way time is going, is meant to tell you the orientation of what it's sitting in. Now, <coughs> see, this is a germ that's getting more curved. It's getting smaller, actually. The metric is shrinking. Now, germs like this come, you see, unitarity has got something to do with reversing orientation. So, it's very important to bear in mind that there are four things, these things come in fours, because you could <coughs> do the following. You could uh, reverse the orientation of n, so that it, and simultaneously reverse the way it's going. So you don't reverse the orientation of the ambient <coughs> That will be something which are called n star. So that's one way of reversing the orientation of the job. Another thing you can do is reverse the orientation of n, but make time keep going the same way. This one I call n bar. And of course you can do both and make n bar stop. So this thing come in force. Now, um, one thing that's automatically true in any theory is that uh, Hn star is the dual of Hn So this has got not this is, an, this is an automatic thing and I'll put a small thing there and a big thing there and so both of these statements are going to be true. Where again the star just means the continuous linear forms always with the compact open topology, uniform convergence on compact set. Now why are these things automatically true? Well you see if, if you take a germ like this, you can think of it as a cobordism which has something slightly downstream of n coming in this way and something slightly upstream of n going in this way. So if you think of that as a cobordism from the empty manifold to n b and n star, this is going to be n star we will get an element of H of this from, from that. On the other hand, uh, we can think of it as a cobordism from that to the empty set going the other way, and that will give us the linear form going the other way. And just looking at the taking limits as the two things come close together, and um, using the axiom, these two things to follow formally. So, so far that's nothing to do with unitarity, but we perhaps have to say one more thing. Yeah. When we have, let's think of a, I'll draw it back this, n naught with a cobordism to m. Uh, so this is going this way. <coughs> this gives us, uh, well, the first thing is to see that we can think of M to the cobordism like this. But the star operation is a contravariant functor. This is equally well a cobordism from N0 star, sorry, N1 star to N0 star. The same M, we just look at it a different way, and it's a cobordism from in the other direction from N1 star to N0 star. So N to N star is a contravariant function. On the proposal that way. On the other hand, uh, N to N bar is covariant. I'm sorry, this thing's all very boring, but I'm just a 
hard to get them right. Well, um, now, you see, the, it, the kind of theory that we're talking about I going to have the property that when we take n bar, that space associated with that is going to be a complex conjugate space. Okay, I should have said, uh, in going, here we don't do anything connected with the complex numbers, but here, with this elementary G, we'll also take the complex conjugate metric on the German map. So if we're working with real manifolds, of course, that with real genes, that isn't going to change anything at all. But we have got to bear that in mind. So we want this property to and that's why I'm going to go later on. So is this true? You see, this would be a Hilbert space like property. To say that this charm can be identified with this charm. Well, you see, that would only happen when there is some reflection across A which reverses the direction of time. So we say that um, N admits a reflection <coughs> if N bar is isomorphic to N star. Uh, and these are germs, so up, I should say, up to as many derivatives as the theory uses. I mean, ideally, you'd like the two germs to be the same, but you, you, you don't actually need so much of that. Well, you see, if that's true, then a complex conjugate like this will give us something like that. And unitarity is the this, this statement that this makes, makes G, in this case, a three Hilbert space. In other words, it's a positive, positive condition. So, you see, we don't expect, even in a theory which, so, so the unitary theory is one in which this is true whenever you have one of these reflect, reflectable germs. So you don't expect the vector space associated to an arbitrary spatial slice uh, to give rise to a Hilbert space, because an arbitrary spatial slice might be very rapidly contracting or very rapidly expanding. And then the dual space will cause from doing the opposite kind of thing in time. So it's only when there's this possibility of reflection, it's traditionally called reflection positivity in standard treatments of quantum field theory, that you expect to go this way. Okay, well, let's get to something a little bit more interesting. So now, uh, let's have something more connected to the Supposing we do have an n naught and an n one, well, well, in fact, supposing we have an n which is reflection reflectable in this sense, and supposing we consider cobordisms from n to itself like this, and suppose we have a unitary theory, so that means we have all these things u n. Uh, <coughs> And okay, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've got to say one thing. I talked about the N, but I didn't tell you about the M. I left out the sentence. What was automatically true without any, without any assumptions at all, was that. When we have a cobordism n0 to n1 m, then we get this cobordism n1 star still m. <laughs> so we get a um this way, and also we get one this way, hn1 star going to h and north star. 
And these are automatically vector space adjoints to each other. That follows from exactly the same argument that I in the internal uh, at the beginning. On the other hand, uh, going with this statement, of course I should have put in the assumption that M bar also takes the operation of its complex function. So in this situation, we have a Hilbert space, or a pre-Hilbert space, and we have the semigroup of trace class and so strongly contracting operators because we can compose these things parameterized by all these hands. And it of course has the properties that unitarity is a property that, uh, that this is the same as Now, so we're interested in what happens if we have that situation, what happens as we go to the boundary of the semigroup? So let, let's think of some finite dimensional examples of this situation. Where we have semigroups like this with something on their boundary. You see, the simplest case is when, supposing we, for example, consider elements endomorphisms of a finite dimensional complex vector space with the usual you know, product. So this is just an n by n complex matrix. And supposing we look at the G, which have operator norm in the usual sense of less than 1. So this is a semigroup. It's a metric now. Hmm? Yeah, so I'm, I'm using the usual metric on this. Uh, well, so this is a semigroup. which clearly has new n on its boundary. Uh, so this has complex dimension n squared. This has real dimension n squared. This is a compact subset of the boundary. It's what's called a Shinoff boundary. I, I don't want to make any precise use of the concept of a Shinoff boundary, but when you have a boundary, complex domain, complex manifold with boundary. Uh, the Shinoff boundary is a closed subset of the topological boundary with the property that continuous functions on the domain which are holomorphic in the interior achieve their maximum always on points of this space. So in other words, a continuous function holomorphic in the interior is certainly completely determined by what it does on the Shinoff boundary. But of course if you have a uh, a function on the boundary, a continuous function on the boundary may well not extend. The typical example is if you take the open unit disk in a complex plane and you so this is from the open unit disk, you take a lot of copies of that, then the boundary is a circle. And uh, this is the Shelov boundary. So if this has got n complex dimensions, this has got n real dimensions. Uh, if you have a continuous function on there, it might or might not be a boundary value of a holomorphic function in the interior, but if it is, the function is determined uniquely. Well, you see, so suppose we ask the question, suppose you have a representation of this semigroup acting on some Hilbert space, uh, <coughs> when does it extend to a unitary representation uh, on the boundary? Or well, conversely, when is a unitary representation the boundary value of a holomorphic representation of this? We have a holomorphic semigroup acting. Well, in this case, of course, it's completely obvious what the answer is. Unitary representations of this, you know, correspond to strings of integers. Uh, and those integers are going to be such that if you take the diagonal element, Uh, the uh, they correspond to um, 
Uh, th these things uh, are determined by giving the weights of the representation. And as long as all the weights uh, involve positive powers of Z, this will be the boundary value uh, of something homomorphic. So, uh, sorry. I think that's gone from our human. So a more interesting example, which is more relevant, is the following. Let's take uh, what I'll call PSL2 contraction of C, which consists of D in PSL2 C. Uh, so it's G of U is contained in the interior of U, where this is the open, uh, well, U, U is the upper half plane. In other words, I think of on the in C two one, <coughs> this group is acting. We have the upper disk U. We consider all those things which map this upper hemisphere into some disk completely contained in the upper hemisphere, contained in the interior of the upper hemisphere. Well, that's a complex semigroup. And on its boundary are the things where G of U is equal to U. So this has PSL to R on its boundary. And so PSL to R is exactly the things which preserve the upper half plane, so this thing doesn't change. Well, uh, on the other hand, that isn't the complete Shilov boundary. Because the complete Shilov boundary, see this is not, not compact. Uh, maybe it's easier to think without the projective group, but to think of SL2C. SL2C topologically is like a solid torus, three-dimensional. Uh, so SL2R is like this, like a solid torus. And it pretty obviously has a boundary, which is an ordinary torus, S1 plus S1. Well, similarly, the uh, complete Shirov boundary of this, when you divide this by plus or minus 1, the boundary is still a torus. So the Shirov boundary, this is a torus, where these are each the real projective line. And or two dual projective lines. These are the two by two matrices which have rank one. So what they do on the projective line is they project everything to some point along another point. So they collapse the whole, they, no, they're not continuous across all the projective line. They collapse everything from one point to the other. So they don't, so if we put on the compactification, this doesn't form a semigroup. So let's ask the question, uh, what, what kinds of representations of this, unitary representations of this, for the boundary value of holomorphic ones of this, and what do they do with respect to these points? Do they give you some unitary transformation there? Well, of course, again, that's extremely well known. If you look at the irreducible representations, of PSL to R and form three kinds. And the only kind that's had hope of this kind of extension is the so-called discrete series representation. And these are the ones which typically enable them acting on the half plane. Uh, these representations happen on things like the boundary values for holomorphic functions on the disk. So clearly if you map the disk into the disk, then a holomorphic function is there and it strips the holomorphic function there. So the discrete series representations certainly restrict. So these are unitary. 
in the unity representation, they restrict to um, contraction representation of the orbit of the of the semi group. And they're the only ones that do. So we precisely by asking for this boundary condition, we see that we pick out a class of unity representations. And that's of course what we want to do in the quantum field theory. Well um, now what happens if we go to bits of the Shilov boundary which are not in the group? You see, supposing you uh, supposing you look at one of these representations and ask what happens if you go right to the edge. You have to say, so in this group, that means we're looking at some things which are going to end up with this degenerate predictive transformation boundary. Well, so we will have a sequence of unitary transformations, but will they limit the unity? Well, certainly not. You see, the typical kind of situation is that the, the S1 cos S1, the operators have a limit in the strong topology. They don't, of course, have a limit in the normal topology. If they did, it would have to be unitary. But this acts, in fact, by rank 1 operators. So, in other words, you have some Hilbert space, and we have a family of unitary operators, say, UT, going to this bad point on the boundary. For each T, as we come to T coming to zero or something, the operator is unitary, and the family is strongly continuous, but when T gets to zero, this is the other extreme from being a unitary operator, it projects the whole Hilbert space typically onto its lowest weight vector, a single one-dimensional piece. Now, this is very interesting in connection with quantum field theory for the following reason. Uh, well, let's, um, let's consider, first of all, the D equals 2 field theory. Uh, so, supposing we're interested in Lorentzian cohortisms like this. So, um, you tend to think the following. If you start at one end, so these are cohortisms from the circle to the circle, we can follow a light, uh, this is Lorentzian, so at each point we have two light directions. So, supposing we set up along a light direction going to the left, we wind round and round, and if we're lucky, we impact on the circle at the other end. And if we're lucky, that will give us a diffeomorphism from S1 to S1. We could also go to right with and go around, and we will hit with bam like that. So that gives us some of the, that, that, so there are a certain class of coordinates which that is true. And this will give us a semi group of Lorentzian angular, which clearly maps to this uh, S1 plus this S1. These are groups, but this is a homomorphism of semigroups. The semigroup of these cylinders maps to this group. And it's nearly a covering, it's not quite objective, because in order to reconstruct the, suppose we're only interested in the conformal structure, that's the simplicity. Suppose we want to reconstruct the conformal structure of that cylinder from the two diffeomorphisms, you can do it uniquely if you know how many times things cross the one from one into the other. So there's a homomorphism of semi group where the kernel is in actual numbers. So the thing above isn't quite a group, but almost. So we expect a thing like this to act unitarily on our Hilbert space in the quantum field direction. On the other hand, um, that isn't the most general kind of Lorentzian structure we could have. Because, you see, uh, we might have a situation like this. The, well, let, let me draw it a bit more schematically, spreading the thing out to a rectangle. 
We might, it might be that the light ray is going to the right, behaving in the most obvious way. But the ones going to the left do something like this. They start curving like this. And we have a closed light direction like that. And then they start behaving normally again. So you could have a pattern like that. And that means that this left-hand light ray just withers round and round and round, and it never gets to the other end at all. Now you see, you should think of that as being like a black hole in space-time. You see, it's something where a light goes in and somehow gets trapped. Because in this very simple three-dimensional situation, a proper black hole can't really occur. Well, <coughs> the things like this are what in physics would be called globally hyperbolic in relativity theory. In other words, these are ones which have a nice <coughs> description. The, the, the usual definition of globally hyperbolic is for non-compact space-time. So if you make the spatial sections compact, it becomes much easier. And then it just amounts to the assertion that you have a nice slicing up of the thing by spatial surfaces, such that the light always sort of flows directly across from one end to the other. Well, so on this subject, you should think of that as like the PSL2R sitting inside the uh, possible space-time evolutions. And you should think of these things as being the bad things on the boundary, like the S1 plus S1 on the boundary of SL2R. And they, you don't expect to act unitarily. And I think that's, that, that's a topic which is very much discussed in general relativity. When you have some black hole or something, do you expect the quantum evolution to be unitary? Well, this is an argument that you don't. Um, uh, well, uh, so, as I can't tell you, I both talked about this thing in the general situation. We both came to the conclusion that if one did have the setup that I was trying to describe in general dimensions, then one could deduce that for the globally hyperbolic thing in the boundary, one did get a unitary transformation. But uh, that, that's a long story, and neither of us has written down a proof. At least I tried to write down a complicated proof, and then Maxime said, well, it's completely obvious, and you don't need to say all that. So I'm slightly, uh, I don't want to stick my neck out too far. But the second is with no extra assumptions, just globally hyperbolic. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. so if we had globally hyperbolic thing and we had a theory which had all these axioms, then it should have the property that for cobordisms, compact cobordisms which were of that kind, they should give rise to unitary operators on the boundary. I mean, we're assuming you know, that the things in the interior act by trace class operators and so on. Okay, now I want to change ground. That's more than enough about... So, so this whole subject is kind of called with rotation. It's the art of going... So from now on I'm really just going to work with Romanian manifolds. So this, this was really an account of how one geometrically can look at the movement from the Romanian to the Lorentzian situation. But from now on I'm going to stick with Romanian things and you can pretty much forget about complex metrics. Uh, so now I want to say some the next general topic I want to talk about, which again I, I, I haven't really been gaining on my plan, I'm afraid, is uh, whether this way of axiomatizing a quantum field theory is adequate. Does one need to put in more things? Now one might need to put in more structure, one might need to put in more axioms. And it's not completely clear to me which one uh, should do. And I want to give some examples and say what I do know in this direction. So, uh, I think
shall be um, the one thing that people who are not mathematicians who are interested in quantum field theory these days seem to be certain to know is the situation of two dimensional topological field theory. So this is defined for manifolds which are not equipped with any structure other than their smooth structure, so no metrics of any kind. Then <clears throat> many people know the Hope theorem, which is said to have been proved by innumerably many people, that these things are equivalent to commutative Fabian algebra.
we can define such an operator just by chopping it up. And the non-trivial step is to see that when you chop it up in different ways, and of course you can chop it up in many different ways, and you might like compare that with something where, so this goes so to speak, from 2 to 1 to 0, so from 2 to 1 to 2, you might go from 2 to 3 to 2 by going That's the same picture, but see if you cut that into elementary steps, it goes differently. So we need to know that the maps that the following diagram commutes when the convenient element is in the same. Which does the easy exercise. But, uh, so you have to check in principle myriad things like that. Uh, well, there are many proofs. In fact, you've got, I'm actually going to give one because it's very slick and because it uses something that I want to use anyway. Uh, put that off just for a moment. see a few facts for, so I want to bear it in mind. But if you'd like to have just a slightly better example, uh, we you see this is a topological theory. There's a theory very close to this, which is an area dependence theory. And the theory I have in mind is two-dimensional the ideals. So then a two-dimensional theory. So, uh, I can say it in two different ways. Uh, on the one hand, we, we, we let's pick a group, a compatible group. Um, maybe imagine it's simply connected, though it doesn't need, actually need to be. Remember, we had this notional space of fields that I described in my last lecture, on, out of which, which are motivated in theory. This will be principal <laughs> G-bundles with connection on M. And we also had an action function or S. Fabinian algebra 
very like what we have. But remember that all the surfaces now have area forms, uh, so they have a total area. Well, you probably know the famous theorem of Moser that any two area forms or a manifold with the same total volume are related by a diffeomorphism. And the same is true with manifold with boundary, uh, leaving the boundary point where it's fixed. So the only thing that these cobordisms have is an area, A, which clearly just adds and composes things. So we can still write A, oh yeah, sorry, not A, but H of S1. But we have now no reason to believe that it's a finite dimensional vector space. Uh, we will have a multiplication because of the pair of hands. In fact, we'll have a family of multiplications depending on A. But there, we have acting on A a semi group of syllables of length A. So these will give us something U A parameterized by positive real numbers. And the different multiplications for different A's, you see, are obviously just link. If we pre, if we apply UA prime to one of the factors, that will just give us the multiplication corresponding to A plus A prime. Well, it turns out that this two-dimensional yang Mills is completely described by a very natural, almost convenient algebra. get in the following way. Take A to be the two infinity functions on the group. Uh, the operator U A is E to the minus A times the Laplacian. So this is the Laplacian of functions on the group, where the Laplacian is described, defined using the inner product on the Lie algebra, which gives you a bi-invariant Romanian metric on the group. And the multiplication is this one, is convolution. And uh, the linear form is just uh, evaluation of the identity by the by the one. Uh, so this is the model. So we have family of evaluations or not? Sorry? We have family of evaluations. Uh, well, so this is, this is a multiplication no, at the end A of xy, f1, f2, two such functions, yeah, yeah. will be ua of f1 convolved like that. See, so we have a family of multiplications. It's about convolution or about a to c. We have family of such maps. Yeah, so, so the structure wants us not, to have not, an MA. Not new, but theta. Okay. So you have a map theta from A to C. But right. it is not unique. We have it's again not family. Unique, no, because again, we have a lot of... Yeah. That if we compose this with UA prime, you see they're all kind of related. So, uh, just to me, I have one theta and then I get all the other theta in five. And this is which one? Of volume one? Of, of area one? Uh, that's going to be volume zero, so to speak. And so any other one, I mean, so theta itself isn't part of the structure. I mean, we define... Oh, it's not good. sorry, yeah. Of volume... So that, yeah. is, theta is defined that way. Theta A is theta converted to A. You know, how about that? So it's time for me to stop, sorry. Uh, gosh. Uh, well, once again, I'm completely not quite keeping up with my schedule. But it's obviously time for me to stop. So on Wednesday, and I have to make an announcement on Wednesday, I just remember to tell you, my lecture is going to be in Weberstrasse 10 in the Kleine Fürstal, not here. 
So that's the first room I ever lectured in in Bonn in 1966. So it's a very sentimental thing for me to be there. And I hope some of you at least will still come. 